Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Brenda Gutierrez, and I'm thrilled to be moderating this conversation today. I uh, wanted to begin by acknowledging the land from which I'm joining you today. I am on Amiskwati Weskihakan in Territory 6, um, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And this is territory of many First Nations and Métis people, including Cree, Dene, Stony Nakoda, Sioux, Soto, and Ojibwe. Um, I wanted to stress the imperative of um, recognizing locally and globally the land on which we work and play and honoring it as we strive uh, respectfully for par partnership and collective healing and reconciliation as we honor this, this beautiful land. Um, so I, I often say I'm a born feminist, um, having only brothers and growing up in the mostly male dominated uh, spaces. I always would say anything you can do, I can do, became a part of, of my life. And uh, when I was once asked, are you a feminist in such a whispered, almost uh, uh, scary way, I thought, what, what's that word? What does it mean? Until you actually hear the definition, which is just believing in humanity and uh, the rights of every human being to have equal opportunity, um, to have uh, what Moses Cody called the full and abundant life. And I thought, that should be everyone. We should have names for those that are opposed to it. <laughs> but I, I, I carry that label loudly and proudly, and I'm, I'm so excited to be a part of, of, of this day today. Um, I'm really passionate about people and connection to people and building community and relationships and having human-centered approaches to development, which led me down the path of economics and development studies and um, community engagement. And I get to channel all that passion in my role as a stakeholder and engagement coordinator at the Center for Employment Innovation at St. FX University, uh, which is uh, work closely with the Cody International Institute at St. FX University in Mi'kmaq Territory in Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, but enough about me. Um, today we are uh, having this conversation marking International Women's Week, Women's History Month. Um, and I'm joined by this wonderful panel of um, brilliant disruptors, as we named this talk today. I wanted to recognize that the UN Commission for the Status of Women, which meets uh, this month in March, also recognizes um, women's leadership as its main theme. I also wanted to acknowledge that this is the 10th anniversary of Cody Institute's International Center for Women's Leadership this year. We're so grateful uh, for the supporters, especially some amazing women who have uh, understood the vision and financially supported us for several years. So I wanted to send a big thank you, a lot of who are joining us today from across the world. Thank you all for joining us. Um, so without further ado, in this spirit, I'd like to um, give the space over to our wonderful panel, Sarika, Robin, Krista, Veronica, and Carolyn. Um, maybe we could go through and uh, hear some introductions from you. We can begin with you, Sarika. Thank you, Brenda. Namaste, everyone. Good evening. I'm Sarika. I come from the central part of India. And uh, uh, I, I must take a moment to sort of acknowledge this beautiful rainbow coalition that we have of women, which not necessarily represents one particular department, but the plethora of experiences that we have of indigeneity, of racism, of feminism, you know, per se. And welcome everyone on board. I come from Bhopal, which is known for all the wrong reasons. So it was a site of the gas tragedy in, in 1984, which led to the death of about 35,000 odd people at the hands of a very, very uh, big corporate. And we know that some of these corporates are bigger than nations themselves. What it's not known for is the way Muslim women rulers ruled it. And it's a site of synthetic traditions. And in an era of cultural exclusivity, it, it's, it's a beautiful site. So uh, I really want to take a moment to talk about the people here, but uh, we, we're short on time and I would love to answer your questions. I want to begin with brilliant disruptors in the form of the first one-stop crisis center in India. And if you see them, you probably don't see anything very different, but actually they are. Please go ahead, Eileen, the next slide, please. 
So this is a story of how women survivors of violence have risen up from the ashes. So these are raped, bruised, battered women and uh, uh, women who've seen and faced multiple violence and also do not have a place or a, or, or a roof above their head. Move ahead, please. So it's a center which is known as Gaurvi, which is, which is a Hindi word and it actually means brave heart. So if, if, if you look at India and our own experiences say that uh, if 10 women get raped, only four report violence. So you really have to be very, very brave to report it given the stigma that people faced. And, those, and the second picture that you see is the site of this place, which is the biggest uh, government hospital in uh, Bhopal, where we are placed right now. And we started with a very small space, almost something less than a room. Move ahead, please. So uh, we, we all know the context and we know that every third woman across the globe is a survivor of violence. But we also know that COVID pandemic actually enhanced this violence in, in a lot many ways. So it did a vivid uh, autopsy of our societies and showed us how racist and classist and, and patriarchal we were. And against that backdrop, I want to show you a picture that you see here is of women, you know, smearing colors on themselves and women who have been usurped and robbed of colors. So these are survivors of violence and how they themselves have made a subjecthood of their own uh, agency and being. And, uh, and, and the entire set of interventions that they have designed, you know, in this one stop crisis center, which now incidentally just got an award yesterday uh, by the state and the central government, you know, uh, weaves its interventions around, around women themselves. So it's, it's no one size fit all. Move ahead, please. And what we've done there is, uh, you know, there's, it's run 80% uh, by women survivors of violence themselves. There's a 24-7 hotline for anybody who faces violence. Move ahead, please. There's medical, shelter, police, and outreach support. So any woman who reaches out to us and, you know, is not able to call us back or we fear for her life, we actually uh, take a visit to her house. And if you look at the top uh, right picture, of the man in the white shirt talking to a woman, he's doing something which is known as a moot court. So we actually conduct uh, moot testimonies so that women can depose before the court on their own. And we know that, that this kind of stigma that a woman goes through when she's, she's seen and faced violence and you know how it's, it gets repeated in courts and she's raped over and over again. So this is to enhance her capacity to, to be able to say no, that she will not respond to a certain kind of questions. Move ahead, please. And I, I just want to talk about transformation since we are talking about these disruptors. So there's a lot of trainings that they do and a lot of it is around critical consciousness. So it's not just about going as a victim and getting a series of services. It's also understanding what's happening across the globe. And I think feminism in a nutshell is about justice. It's not just about women. It's a very, very intersectional discourse. And the pictures that you see are, are the pictures of these women conducting their own workshops with, with a group of uh, us who are, who are their advisors and, and sort of resource persons on a lot of issues uh, in which now it's become so coveted that a lot of people apply. So you have students and you have people from other social movements who come in and, and they are a part of it. What it gives them is the ability to question and confront. And we all know that the most intimate is the most difficult to confront, which is the family itself. And uh, you know these enhanced capabilities lead women to kind of start having a dialogues amongst uh, amongst themselves. And the other thing that it very strongly establishes amongst women is a notion of economic justice. And I, I wouldn't just call it economic rehabilitation. So once they start earning, and, and in the bottom you can see some of these pictures. So women who have been thrown out of their homes, you know, whether it's their own uh, 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 an incidence of domestic violence or they have been stigmatized so much that their families don't want to keep them on account of rape. How do they stand on their own feet? And, and in, in the bottom, the pictures that you see are pictures of them having been trained, but it's not just around these. We have the first women auto rickshaw drivers here, the plumbers, the electricians, people who are seriously challenging gender stereotypes. And we also had women to now talk a lot about bodily integrity. So how do you say no to marital rape, which is something that's not really acknowledged in our law, apart from one particular civil law that we've had of late. 
And, and the other thing that I want to talk about is social networks, which is a big resource. So, you know, what? who are our friends once we face violence? We've more or less been given away by everyone. And how do we enhance these social networks and, and feel that I'm not the only one who faced violence? And that is very important for the collective agency. So it's not just an individual agency that gets built. And it's, it's these women who have done it. Please go ahead. So these are some pictures you see of people around the lockdown when nobody was coming out on the road. These women auto rickshaw drivers actually managed to get ration and they distributed to it to the most precarious population in Bhopal. And guess who were these people? These people were primarily the, the minorities here, the ethnic minorities and the transgendered people. So these are some of the pictures of the food relief distribution. Please go ahead. These, this, these are some of the, the news that, that you see around them. So uh, starting from Wire to Guardian and Independent, most of the international news uh, uh, agencies have covered them. Please go ahead. Always good to have some money on your hands. So now they're actually negotiating more space for e-rickshaws because you know uh, feminism and ecological justice go together. So they're they are talking a lot about ecology. The second picture that you see, uh, is of a very, very coveted location in, uh, in India and in Bhopal. So which is, uh, you know, which is a site of the main market and uh, the rents here are about thousand Canadian dollars per week. We've got it for free and we've got women to sell their handmade products there. It's, it's, it's still going on today as we speak. Please go ahead. So these are some of the other pictures that you see of women having uh, picked up red bus. The, the bottom right picture is the first woman bus driver in uh, Madhya Pradesh. Also one of the first in India to actually drive the public transport. Move ahead, please. And yes, there's a lot of challenging of doxa and institutions of dominance takes place. So we are into a lot of sit-in protests. We are into a lot of public action and rallies. But we try not to ape the leadership that we have seen of the dominant people. So it's, it's the feminist value of justice and ecology at the, at the core. Move ahead, please. So these, these are these women who have formed their own. Uh, they use a lot of theater of the oppressed medi medium, which was something that evolved out of Brazil by Augusta Baul. So they create a, a a place then and there on domestic violence, on rape, on molestation, on chastity belts. And you know, talk, talk to the people who stay across the, the so-called mainstream people. And these are some of the pictures of that. Move ahead, please. And, and yes, this is the media gallery. Just keep moving ahead, please. I think I've, I've reached the end. Yes, and this, this is in Hindi, so I'm sorry you won't be able to read it, but thank you so much. And, and hats off to these amazing women. Thank you, Brenda, over to you. Thank you, Sarika. And uh, to get a, another global context here um, from Veronica Torres. Thanks very much, Brenda. Um, I, you know, from, for me, I'm right now in the Oshawa and I recognize the land um, where I am currently, which is the end of the Mississaugas of the Skagag First Nations, Island First Nations. Um, but also I wanted uh, to um, share that I am actually partly indigenous, actually from Ecuador. I actually am a mix of, um, of the indigenous peoples of Ecuador, but also of the uh, Ecuadorian, Afro-Ecuadorians who sit on the coast of Ecuador as well. So I represent quite a mix of, uh, of um, ethnicities. And um, I came to Canada as a, a young child of seven years and learned English very quickly. Um, and as uh, a lot of my lived experience actually then came to represent what I did in my life, I learned that I needed to um, really navigate my family life in a very different way. Uh, as a child that was growing up in Canada with very Ecuadorian family. And in that, uh, by the time I was 15, I learned to negotiate that my mother wasn't the only one that could, had to cook at home, um, that uh, my father too could do it, that my brother too could do it. And that uh, at 15, I could say to my father, actually, you will, 
not be smoking in our home. And you will need to move outside when you do that. And a lot of the dynamics in the household were challenged. And I think that was part of what led me to believe in feminism itself and led me to do a lot of my work in um, looking at the economics of, of, uh, of my own life, but also of that of other women and young women particularly. So I started working very young. At the age of 12, I was doing my first job. Uh, later on, I started earning um, in different kinds of retail opportunities. I never stopped working. Uh, so when later in life, when I was working in an international organization and we worked on issues of child work, um, someone said to me, you know, no one should be working until they're 18 or over. And I said, well, I had to work when I was 12. So I don't understand your views of child labor on others. Um, so issues around, I became more aware of Western lenses on other cultures, particularly from a Latin American perspective, and the ideas that came from, from the West and how they were influencing other notions of gender, feminism. Um, so my work has in uh, international settings with a diverse range of organizations has been focused on well, what do these concepts mean? Let's break them down. What do we mean by women's leadership in the context of Rwanda, in the context of Ethiopia, um, South Africa? When we talk about um, these countries and these contexts, um, for example, in, in Asia and in, in diverse places that I have been, um, many people talk about gender policing rather than the concept of what what are we trying to do with, uh, by looking at equality and equity for, for women? And this is something that uh, as I work more and more with um, in the area of economics and now more so in the area of education is what are the uh, things that these young women have already lived through? What do they already bring? And what is that, uh, you know, how do we build on that? Uh, I remember traveling into Bangladesh one time and uh, working with an organization that told me we did our assessment. These young women don't do anything to earn any money. We're really going to have to work hard at it. And I said, well, let's go together as a team and find out what is actually happening with women and particularly with young women in this uh, southern Bangladesh. We went together. And we discovered that there were about 15 earning activities that these young women were involved in. And in fact, that was enough to convince a savings institution to open up accounts for these young women. So it was actually a huge opportunity, but we, we saw that there was already young women's leadership moving forward and that fathers were very supportive of that, um, of that part of their lives. So we, you know, in my work, I've realized that uh, young women's leadership particularly and that of their mothers is something we can tap into, that there are so many things that these women are already doing. Uh, in the, and in the face of COVID itself, you know, there's, there's so much that, um, so much resilience that I definitely have read about and have heard about in a number of countries and um, what, what has um, really caught my attention was the ability of women to adapt, the ability of women to be resilient. And I know in a recent uh, Harvard Business Review, that was one of the things that really attracted people that, you know, as in terms of leadership, the ability for adaptation. And this is why women are seen as stronger leaders in a lot of ways because of their ability to adapt. Uh, and I think from my own experience, a lot of, a lot of what I have seen and I, what I have lived is about our resilience uh, in terms of um, adapting to challenges, coming through those and, um, and really working with other women along, along that route. So I'll hand it back to you, Brenda. Thank you, Veronica. 
I mean, hearing themes that go across both all contexts of the women empowerment having to include economic empowerment, building capacity in young women to lead, um, sisterhood, very important. Um, I'll pass it on to you, Krista. Good morning. I think it's late morning where you are. Well, it's a book. Deloise Krista Hanscom, Delewe Bakungek Mi'kmaq Nation, Akwigi Marguerite Mi'kmaqi. Wape Wape Kiheo Atako Snitsigasan. So good morning. My name is Krista Hanscom, and I am from the, the Bakungek Mi'kmaq Nation here in Mi'kmaq. And I'm currently living in Marguerite. And it's a, a beautiful day, a beautiful place to be. And um, just want to acknowledge the, the land that I'm from and, and speaking with you today. Um, when I think about feminism and women's leadership, I, I think of my mother and the work that I do. I've been working in education now for um, a little over 15 years. And my passion comes from my mom. She's always instilled um, a drive for education for learning. She was my first teacher. Um, and I honor that. And but on the, the flip side of that is, um, you know, one of the biggest reasons why I became involved in, in education is, um, you know, knowing my mom's story and that education and school and, and the system wasn't always a, a good place for her wasn't always a, a safe space for her. But she always shared with us the, the good things that she took from her experiences. Um, my mother experienced a lot of uh, discrimination and challenges in her life, um, but I've never thought of her as a victim. I've always thought of her as a fierce survivor. Um, and I think about how she's instilled that in me and my sister and those around her. And that's why I, I do the work that I do. I think about um, you know, women's leadership in terms of our teachings that we I've received from um, Mi'kmaq elders and um, elders and knowledge keepers in Treaty 6 territory where you are, Brenda. And the teaching that I, I come away with is how important each and every one of us are within a community and within a family. You know, our children are so important um, and our elders and our women are honored because of the, the gift that creator has given for them to be able to bring life into the world and to nurture that life and, and teach. And they are, our mothers are our first teachers, our grandmothers are our first teachers. And so I honor that. And when I think about working with women and the leadership opportunities and the changes that they make in their communities and within their families, I think of those teachings and how we need to honor um, our women. And oftentimes um, in conversations, uh, Brenda, you mentioned your, your brothers and, and, and having a family with lots of, um, you know, different dynamics happening. And I think of you know, in my family, I, I also honor my father. My father taught me to be a strong woman as well. Uh, he, he wanted his daughters to be able to change tires and be interested in cars and trucks. And um, he didn't um, limit us to, to gender roles. So I, I appreciate that as well. And so when I think about feminism and women in leadership, I think about how we all uh, contribute and all need to honor those teachings of how each and every one of us um, have an important role to play in one another's lives, in our communities, and advancing our communities and, and keeping our children and our women safe and, um, you know, treating one another with kindness and love, that we each have a part to play in um, lifting our women up and supporting them and um, helping them achieve everything that they can achieve. So I thank you for, um, for letting me introduce myself and I'm excited to, to hear from everyone else and join in this conversation. So back to you, Brenda. Thank you, Krista. And I, I love the common theme of leadership, but we will unpack that shortly. Um, I will pass it on to you, Robin. Hello. Hi, Brenda um, and everyone. Thank you all for, for joining us today. 
So, um, so I just want to acknowledge that I am here in Nova Scotia, also called Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory or homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples. Um, and I moved to here to Anaganish from Southern Manitoba, Treaty One territory, the traditional territory of a national. Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. My ancestors immigrated to Canada in the 1870s and early 1900s from what is now known as Ukraine. Um, so I have three points that I um, kind of want to touch on in regards to talking about brilliant disruptors, women leadership and transformation. And the first I want to share is um, recognition that there's no universal experience of being a woman. So diversity um, exist in diversity can be wisdom. And I say this um, speaking from a very personal um, experience and that I grew up on the intersection of, an intersection of expectations of lived experiences for females, both in my community and my extended family. Simply put, um, you can kind of characterize these as uh, progressive and, and conservative. So the progressive that I saw around me growing up was, you know, what many people might call modern for the time. I mean, in the sense, you know, Females wearing pants, shorts, short hair, going to secondary school, graduating secondary school, working a job outside of the home. And by conservative, I mean females wearing dresses to or below the knee. Um, dresses made by a predetermined pattern of a particular and appropriate fabric, long hair, so you don't cut your hair. Finishing grade six, maybe going to secondary school, but not graduating secondary school and working in the home or on the farm. And as a child, this diversity was normal for me, although I did question the differences. So why, why, why was it like this? Sometimes outside, out loud, but sometimes I would question it in my head and my heart. And I'm still learning from this diversity that there's no one woman experience um, and that the experiences of women, gender roles, expectations are evolving over time, sometimes fast and sometimes slow. Um, and in this disruption and through this disruption, we learn. Now, my second point is when we look, really look at what are often dismissed as the mundane, ordinary events of our everyday, the routines of sleeping, waking, eating, schooling, working, parenting, and playing within our households and communities, actions that we take for granted or dismiss or over, are overlooked um, and ordinary. And we might just see these as care work, yet this care work sustains humanity, um, life, animals, plants, the earth, care work sustains it all. And not just sustains it, but it helps it to thrive. And it's essential to our well-being. Um, to the everyday, you know, women are taking on various roles to support the everyday, to step up, out, and into roles to care for life, justice, and peace. In my research on women involved in their communities around the world, I've heard time and again about this diversity of women's experiences as citizen care workers in war zones, crisis zones, new democracies, old democracies, urban and rural communities. Women have done many things, established shelters, crisis centers, health clinics, schools, playgrounds, food banks, BSLAs. They advocate for policies, policy change, laws, respect and justice often in complex and complicated ways and settings and in their diverse realities with sometimes stark contrasts, what I saw everywhere are women doing significant actions within their spaces, making space where they can to advocate. And in doing this, they are brilliant. They learned and are learning to be brilliant and we learn from and with them. And because this work is done by women in the everyday, every day, it is often unnoticed, not recognized for the significance it has on me, you, all of us. The significance we need to learn this. Being unnoticed can be a good thing. It's a flying under the radar is a good strategy for getting things done. And at the same time, being unnoticed means that the accomplishment and validation are not given. What is on the radar makes the headlines and the history books, not just women's work, but not just women's work or we women's work, and we lose part of that collective story. For my final point I wanna share, um, so I drive a car and every time I drive a car, I'm very grateful for the lines that are on the highway, dividing the lanes um, for safety. Um, but at the same time, I know that those lines just suddenly didn't magically appear 
And I'm grateful to the women's institutes that advocated to have those lines put on our highways. And not a lot of us understand or know the story of how those lines came on our highways and that it was women advocating for the safety of communities and people as people started, as cars became more popular over a hundred years ago to get those lines on our roads. And it's these type of stories that are really important to understand, to know, to know those everyday ways that we don't even know anymore about how women have made an impact on our everyday lives. A few months ago, there was a video on going around on the internet featuring significant women leaders from now to going back to about 30 years. And it was a powerful and hopeful visual pleasing show. And the last image on the screen said, the women are coming. Honestly, this made me mad. What do you mean the women are coming? <sighs> the women are here and have been here the whole time, all the time, every time. In reality, Many people simply just have not seen him, seen us, but we're here. And we need to question and challenge the practices and systems that have made and make women invisible or say the women are coming. There are currently 22 elected women heads of state in the world. And guess what? Women have been leaders in many different ways, using different types of power throughout history, including leading empires. We need to keep disrupting the systems and narratives that marginalize and silence women. We need to ask for and look for these stories to see our whole collective story and to learn. Thank you. Back to you, Brenda. That was wonderful, Robin. Thank you. Quickly had to pull up a quote that rang true to your words of women having different stories, but having that commonality of womanhood, um, no matter the intersectionalities of the challenges and, and barriers we face. There's a unity in, 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 in our experience. And it's a quote from Audre Lord, I'm not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own. And th that quote came alive in me when you were speaking. Thank you, Robin. Um, last but not least at all, um, Carrie Lynn will be joining us by phone. Hi, Carrie Lynn. Hi, Brenda. Um, I'll give Eileen a minute to um, upload a video that I've recorded. I'm just going to introduce that briefly and then and then I'll pass it over to Eileen. So, um, Dungok Nildali with Gizuskan. Greetings, everyone. My name is Carrie Lynn. I am a Wolastagao woman, woman from Wolastagook, Woodstock First Nation in New Brunswick. And this is where I'm speaking to you from. I am also faculty at the Cody Institute. I have worked with Indigenous women for um, about a decade and worked directly with hundreds of leaders, elders, and mentors. I believe that in order for you to know why I do the work that I do, you must first understand part of my story. I grew up on three different reserves in New Brunswick, mostly my mom's reserve of Woodstock First Nation. Um, while I heard our our language, the Willistico language daily. I did not grow up with a lot of cultural knowledge or pra practicing spirituality. I attended the Catholic Church and spoke English. Um, I, can, I come from a small reserve, but from a very large and loving family with some strong aunts and uncles uh, who I carefully watched, listened to, and, and learned from my whole life and continue to. I also tagged along uh, with my mom on her trips to attend the New Brunswick Native Women's Meetings. I heard many, many, many strong women speaking and working for our rights and calling attention to injustices we faced. While I did not understand at the time, um, my mother actually arranged for me to have a sweat lodge ceremony. It was the first one in our community for a very, very long time. Um, and it was in celebration of, of, of my womanhood. I went on myself to be an active member of the New Brunswick Native Women's Association, and, uh, as well as the Assembly of First Nations Youth Council. Um, I co-created the New Brunswick Aboriginal Youth Council, um, and then also represented Canada at the 1999 UNESCO Youth Conference in Paris. So these were my foundations, uh, kind of of my story. You know, I went on to study uh, Maliseet history and language in university, I was really eager to understand how we're, 
how we particularly were severed from our lands and from the wealth of our ancestors. In my 20s, I had my naming ceremony, which most Indigenous people have as babies. And repatriating those ceremonies is, is, has been a really important piece um, to understanding my own identity and going on my own healing journey. That name that I was given and the story that I received uh, with my name really told me about the future work that I would do. Um, and my name is Gizuskan, which means sunflower. And um, the elder who gave it to me said this is the same uh, name she gave to her granddaughter. And she said that because I, she believed that I would go on to work with Indigenous women and girls. And from that, you know, from that point on, I, I think that was um, anchored into my into my brain because at that time that's not what I was doing. Um, by 2007, I was working to support Indigenous students and discovered the most inspiring and successful people I work with were often single Indigenous mothers. Uh, by 2011, I found my way to Cody and uh, was an inaugural member of the 2011 Indigenous Women in Community Leadership Cohort. And as you, many of you know, my story has come full circle. I'm grateful to have the honor of working with strong, intelligent Indigenous women leaders every day. I get to learn from their wisdom. I get to support them and find support uh, from them in our collective struggles. I know that I'm not alone on this healing journey. I learn every day how to be a stronger, holistic woman. Eileen, if you would start the video, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. Starting it right now. Carrie Lynn. My name is Carrie Lynn and I come from Woodstock First Nation in New Brunswick. I've worked with Cody for the last three and a half years and I'm happy to be here talking about Indigenous women's leadership. Well, I've been working in this area for close to five years um, or more. I continue to see Indigenous women working hard to make change. As ever, we're continuing to paddle those rough waters upstream to create safe and well communities, healthy communities and families. Um, prior to colonization, Indigenous women played several roles, leadership roles, as caretakers of of land as contributing decision makers, trusted advisors, knowledge keepers, healers, um, most importantly, conveyors of our culture and language. And some of them were even warriors that went into war um, with others for their nations. Unfortunately, colonization totally obliterated those roles for indigenous women. The, colonizer, co the colonizers wanted only to deal with one chief, which was usually male. Christianity caused spiritual confusion and replaced community, important community values. Um, that sense of inclusiveness of decision-making was destroyed. Uh, patriarchy in particular and male dominance caused the most havoc, really, really anchoring and um, anchoring a long and twisted relationship of violence against Indigenous women. I kind of liken it to we were, we're all in the canoe together and essentially at contact and or shortly after, the women were all thrown overboard of the canoe. Um, and, in, and to some degree, we, we have been flailing in the water still. Um, you know, Canada continues to have an inconceivable number of Indigenous women enduring violence, living in poverty, imprisoned, parenting, single parenting, um, dealing with addictions. Um, they've gone missing and, they're, and they've been murdered. These are all things that can't continue to go on. But there is good news. You know, our lives and our, and our canoes are being rebuilt. Indigenous women are doing their part to transform the world. We're revitalizing and integrating our cultural values and beliefs into into meaningful um, into meaning for today's reality. 
when I think when we focus on the abundance available in our communities, which I think Indigenous women do really well, uh, as leaders, we also know that it takes all of us in the community um, to rebuild our communities, to rebuild our canoes. Uh, once, once those are rebuilt, we can welcome all community members into that space. We know that everyone has gifts and talents and we all are seeking to feel a part of something and to feel valued. Our modern leadership roles as Indigenous women, I see as uh, being land and water defenders, um, teachers, uh, being in political uh, positions, care, continuing to carry on culture and language and those important things that really make us Indigenous people. And we're ready to be heard and to cry out to return to values, to those traditional values and learning from, you know, the natural world and from our natural laws. Some may not like what we have to say. Um, and like a canoe, I feel like, you know, that cuts through those, those rapids. Uh, sometimes that's what Indigenous women leaders need to, need to do. They need to be disturbers of the status quo. We need to use that, I, the idea or that concept of the two-eyed seeing. You know, we have our Indigenous histories and our knowledges and educations and ways of being and knowing. And we have to braid that with the understanding of our contemporary context, really to, to meet these contemporary needs of our present communities. To step into leadership, many of us have become cycle breakers. You know, some of us are the first to go to, to university or the first to hold uh, jobs in political positions or, you know, the first to, to uh, move from our communities into an urban setting or, you know, there, there's many, I think there's many of us that have, that are, that have had to be the first to do things in our family. You know, sometimes that, that means turning away from uh, d the dysfunctional pieces of our past to create better futures for our children, our families, and our communities. Um, we, have we have discovered we need to constantly maintain our healing through that process. And um, from my perspective, that healing is, is an essential part of leading. You know, being an Indigenous woman leader already has systematic and complex challenges. We need to stop blaming ourselves for what has happened to us. Many of us are still stuff, suffering under oppression that our internal uh, colonization, our internal uh, oppression. I include myself in that, uh, and, and it's an ongoing battle. You know, I think that's very much how, where where that healing part comes in. You know, adapting to colonization has kept us in a state of um, going back to that analogy of near drowning, you know, we're attempting to hold our chins above that rapidly moving water, trying not to slip under it. Um, but many of us are, are not only getting back into the canoe, but we're extending a hand to pull others into that canoe as well. You know, the more that we can, um, we can support each other and support um, other Indigenous women to to uh, come back and to restore those really important roles and responsibilities that that we need to take up in our, in our communities, and, and many of us are doing. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. I, I truly do appreciate you bringing up healing in that perspective from the indigenous um, experience. And again, with our shackles being different in different contexts, we still really are in a unified fight for equality, equity. And uh, as Robin's example showed, fighting for women's rights is fighting for the well being of humanity. You know, it's not an exclusive of just um, uplifting women and it ends there. This impact is is global. It is it's inclusive of all. 
Um, and with that, I'm wondering what International Women's Day means to you all. It is, it's a loaded, it's a loaded day celebration um, in all the different contexts where in many ways it's about dismantling and uh, burning to the ground the patriarchal system. <laughs> um, in some contexts, uh, we view this movement as a dismantling the system to build something new, something inclusive of all. But as um, Carolyn mentioned, in other contexts, it's about decolonizing in this post-colonial world. It's about reclaiming our history. It's about reclaiming our identities, our ways of knowing and being in contexts that uplifted and elevated and empowered women. Um, but again, it's, it's, it, the power is in that unity of bringing together um, all perspectives and contexts and building a sisterhood and weaving these ways of knowing into this, this fabric that will sustain uh, the, the impact of the change that we're looking to bring about. So I'm opening it to you all. I'm curious to hear what International Women's Day means to you all. Feel free to popcorn this or I can put someone on the spot. <laughs> Sarika, go oh, ahead. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been I've been giving this some thought. You know, we had um, you know some conversations preparing for this event, um, as well as I'm beginning to build um, my course material for um, the position, my new position with the Circle of Abundance. Um, I'm one of the um, the program teaching staff there. So as I started to prepare and, and gather resources and um, and then think about um, you know this event and International Women's Week, Women's Day. Um, you know, again, I thought about the women in my life, in my life, um, who have shaped my identity and who I am and how I uh, contribute to my family, how I contribute to my work. And, you know, as I mentioned before, I've the women in my life have had tremendous struggles and difficulties, and that's not how I view any of them. I view them all as um, fierce warriors and fighters and um, disturbers as well. Um, so this day for me is a is a reflection of those women who have, um, you know, fought against their circumstances, risen above their circumstances, have lifted one another up. I think of our grandmothers and our ceremonial teachers who, um, who risked a lot to hold on to our teachings, who, you know, risk being put in jail. Um, I think about our Indigenous women who were disconnected from their communities and their teachings um, through the Indian Act and through, um, you know, different aspects of colonization. And for me, um, International Women's Day should, should be every day. It should be something that we are thinking about every day because our women hold so many of our teachings and they, they show us um, how to, how to take the best of of a bad situation or, or, or circumstances, um, how to lift one another up. And then I also think, you know, we need to, um, to keep our women at the forefront of our work, um, the forefront of our minds and our thoughts in terms of um, protecting them. Um, you know, Carrie Lynn mentioned um, the staggering statistics of um, missing and murdered indigenous women in, in Turtle Island. Um, and that's not, that's not right. And we need to, to do something to change that. Um, I came across a, a quote uh, today that I wanted to share. Um, it's from an introduction of a book called The Strength of Women, Akamea Mowak by Priscilla Sede. Um, there's uh, contributions from many different women in here, but um, I just wanted to share this line with everyone. 
There is a saying that a nation is not conquered until the hearts of its women are on the ground. We are living proof that hearts can rise, hope can flourish, peace can exist, and a new world can be built. Lalin. Thank you, Krista. And Sarika, I noticed you, you had muted, un unmuted your mic there. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, you know what, just to go back to uh, what, what the feminist movement began with, you know, when we were in the process of declaring 8th March as, as the International Women's Day, and you know, as a part of the autonomous feminist movement in India, you know, we fear when you have a day declared in your name, because that means you're probably an endangered species. So, you know, you, we, we've now got an International Tigers Day and a World Indigenous Day. And is it because, uh, you know, there are people who are becoming extinct? And, and you see, that's, that's one of the things that's happening across, because if it's not women being extinct in person, it's certainly their identities and the unfreedom. But, you know, I, I want to go back again to this question that you were asking. So it, it meant uh, bread and peace to them then. And I don't think that has changed a lot. It still means bread and peace. And, uh, you know, as, as you look at this moment now and uh, the world becoming, uh, you know, there are different facets of fascism and very nuanced faces that one needs to recognize. So whether it comes in the name of nationalism, in the name of Hindutva, or in terms of uh, xenophobia towards refugees, uh, it, it is fascism nevertheless. So peace is certainly required. And, but peace does not come in without bread. And I think that's one thing that we really need now. So they started with bread and peace and we're still at bread and peace. So how, how much of it has changed? And uh, Caroline, while you spoke about colonization so well, there's a new form of neo-colonialism that we are seeing now, which is more economic than really political and, you know, going across the world and conquering it in, in, in the old school style. But so, so, you know, there are corporates that are bigger than nations themselves. And, and how do you deal with this kind of capitalism is another question that we need to look at. Because uh, the more the, more the carbuncles of, pay, of, of capitalism extend, more is patriarchy and more is the unfreedom of women. And, and, that's, and, and that's why today, you know, amidst the COVID pandemic, which really exposed us, we have to look at this question through a very nuanced angle, you know, of both economy, polity, and, and ecology together. Thank you. Thank you, Sarika. It's Carrie Lynn. It's over to you. Can I go now? <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Go ahead. Perfect. Um, you know, yeah, like Krista said, we had some conversations to prepare for, for this um, this talk. And uh, I, I really always have to question, you know, is this, is International Women's Day um, centered in Indigenous wisdom and knowledge? And and I don't know that it is, you know, when I when I think about how do we as Indigenous women celebrate each other, you know, in my story about my mother um, asking for a sweat lodge ceremony for my, you know, for my joining womanhood, you know, that to me, that was her honoring me in ceremony. Um, I think that is something that's centered in Indigenous wisdom and knowledge and and I think we do that every day. And, and, and so I, while I um, can respect that International, or International Women's Day um, is an opportunity for us to celebrate kind of our common struggle, you know, I think it's also, um, I kind of take it <laughs> as my own and say, you know, this is, this is an opportunity to acknowledge the struggle of other um, indigenous women, you know, I see your struggles. I recognize um, that that particular leadership is not easy, um, you know, and to tell you that you're not alone um, in all of this, and and to ask you to to help um, each other figure out ways to support each other, you know, and how to how to celebrate how we have been so resilient um, in the face of 
of colonialism and now, as Sergis said, neocolonialism. Um, we we always seem to figure out ways how to um, create spaces um, for um, for our communities and our families to be as well as possible. And um, you know, I take on this day as a as a, a day to kind of celebrate that that resilience of Indigenous women. Um, if if nothing else and and uh but knowing that we have our own ways um and that's okay thank you thank you carolyn um oh, veronica sure Morgan. um yeah. <laughs> I, you know for me i agree with um with everyone else in terms of um the importance of recognizing each other every day. Um, that International Women's Day is, um, you know, it brings it forward, but it's something that for me, it's about recognizing each other every day, um, celebrating each other's um, challenges, successes on a regular basis, acknowledging that we're uh, diverse and contributors and we're doing things in so many ways to, um, also pay forward the path for uh, others who are coming in terms of the other generations. And I definitely think about my own daughters in that, um, who are young women right now and who are, um, you know, to their own right, <laughs> opted for non-traditional uh, careers and who uh, are in their own right uh, young leaders, and I see that in so many um, in so many contexts as well of, of uh, um, colleagues and friends who are in who are mothers who are mothers of young girls and young women who are modeling um, uh, a set of values and struggles that are unique. It's definitely not what my mother paved before me, and it's definitely different for uh, each generation coming forward. So I see that as um, something we, you know, I tend to do special acknowledgements to different women in my family who are uh, trailblazers in health and um, my, you know, my grandmothers who did so much in their own right around uh, legal issues. And I just think about what what the what that all means to different women in this field and what they're modeling for others. So for me, that's how I see um, each and every day, and especially on International Women's Day, a, a special kind of light on it. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you, and Robin. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity, and it's. I'm, I'm really appreciating it and resonating with what my colleagues have shared. And, um, and I, you know, for me, every day, well, every March 8th, when it comes around, I go back to the history of International Women's Day before it was an institutionalized, recognized day kind of taken over by the powers that be. And, you know, and I appreciate Sarika's referencing to, to that history, that women's international women's, the Women's Day as we kind of know it, why we celebrate it when we do, goes back to the laborage and suffrage movements of the 1800s, early 1900s. And, um, and, and that women were marching every day for things that we take for granted now, right? Labor laws, uh, you know, a 40 hour work week, a lunch break, um, you know, dignity and decent working conditions, the right to vote, right? And so I think, you know, it's a day that can kind of, you know, highlight or be a stepping off point to think about as others have shared what we do every day that, and to acknowledge the women in the past but also acknowledge the women now who are important, who are being brilliant, who are being disruptors, brilliant disruptors to change the world, to make it better because it's not great. 
And, you know, a tradition that I have in, in my house on internet on March 8th is that in the morning when I wake up my daughter, we read a book called Brave Girl, which tells the story of Clara Lemlife, who organized the largest, you know, as a young, in 1908, 1909, as a young new immigrant Jewish girl uh, standing at just under five feet tall, organized the largest, largest garment workers strike in the history of New York City, and which started, you know, was part of that, you know, labor movement that we now, which led to the day today. And so I think going back to the history, you know, and, you know, as Veronica has shared too, and Carrie Lynn and, and everyone has shared about acknowledging the women who have come before us. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, acknowledging the stories, the histories, the success stories and stories of abundance. Um, we have here a comment from Harris, hopefully I'm saying your name right, of, you know, why not a worldwide woman leadership exchange of best practices and lessons learned as a sustainable development goal um, and balancing out that narrative of achievements versus challenges. Because th there's a long way to go, but we have come a long way and really ba balancing that narrative. Um, we have a question here from Josephine who gives her context uh, from Cameroon, which is characterized by patriarchy, conflict, and now COVID, which seems like uh, that's, that's a, conf uh, a context similar across the, across the world. Her question is, how could women who are generally considered um, as their part being in the kitchen, who impose themselves into leadership levels, push through practically to get their voices heard at the political front line? Fair game for anyone on the panel. It's Carrie Lynn, that's the short answer, but you can't do it alone. You know, find those women um, who have the same beliefs and and um, aspirations as you do and, and work collectively towards that goal. Um, because we can't get there on our on our own, and even if we did, we very few of us can survive um, the hardships of leadership and the challenges of leadership without without each other and mutual support. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Anyone on the panel here with the? Magic wand solution for us. <laughs> Sarika, go ahead, thank you. you know, that's precisely the question, you know, uh, do we accept or normalize that kitchens are our spaces or it is, is it much more than that? And I think the point that I was trying to make earlier was that, you know, if women survivors of violence can come up and, you know, start having their dreams about elections and changing the whole world, why is it that the other women cannot? And I think I, I think the strength lies not in falling, but you know being able to rise up. And I, I think that that we recognize pretty well. So I think it, it it has to start. I don't have a magic wand. None of us do, and I don't think you were expecting one either. But I think this process of agency and collective consciousness, you know, that has to start coming from within. And then an analysis of what's happening and what's injustice. Once that starts happening, then I think women will get their space. And, and a lot of us have, it's not that things haven't changed and they will, but we have to push it harder and keep pushing it. And not just women, also men along with it. I'll just add that um, it's really important to, um, to keep who you are, to, to honor your identity in whatever you're doing. Uh, if you're moving into leadership roles or, or political realms, um, not to compromise, not to um, quiet those things about your personality or, or who you are, your identity, um, because you think that you need to in order to, to fit into a space, um, bring your whole self, uh, honor your identity, honor your grandmothers and your mothers, um, honor your, your future children um, by staying true to your identity and your teachings from your community. And you know, really looking at the gifts that you hold 
that can contribute to, um, you know, that leadership position and the gifts of those around you that can support you. Like Carrie Lynn was saying, um, relationships and um, connection really move things forward when you have uh, a network of people uh, behind you, whether it's uh, physically uh, having uh, people support you and around you or just calling upon your ancestors and calling upon uh, those who have guided you before. Um, so yeah, just stay, staying true to your identity in all that you do. This is Robin, I wanna hop in um, <clears throat> kind of to build on, I would bring those two kind of questions together and build on what, what others have said as well is I think that we need to expand the conver conversations around um, success, successes and challenges. That's a very dichotom you know, um, dichotomy way of looking at things. And, um, and to build on you know, the ideas that have been shared and also the work of Cody is that I think it's not just successes and challenges, but we also need to think of what are the assets that we have to make this happen. Um, you know, and so like I've heard, you know, Krista was talking about what are the gifts that we bring. Carrie Lynn is talking about the collective, right? So it's not looking at these points at the end, these extremes, but also what do we have now to bring us there? One of the assets that we have are the stories. I keep getting back to storytelling and people who know me know that I really value storytelling as a way of knowing and learning and doing. Um, but we have stories of women and, and, and allies, women and men who have, and, and others, all humans who have gone before to bring us there. We have, you know, we have knowledge, skills, attitudes that are assets that we bring into this work. And so I think that is really important for making this change happen. Thank you. And I also wanted to acknowledge the other team members, past and present of the Women's Leadership Center, uh, the mentors, the associates in our alumni network, which is close to 2000 people. And this is just since 2011. So it's exciting, exciting welcome from across the world. And with that, I'm, I'm wondering if Robin, Carolyn, you're able to share some of the impact stories from our graduates in, in leadership. It's, it's Carrie Lynn. Um, you know, there are so many women who have come through our doors and through our programs. And, you know, I always am humbled by the fact that many of these women have come to, um, to this work already um, as wonderful leaders with some very strong um, skills and assets already. And, you know, like I think of, I think of the work of, of Lorelai Williams, one of our graduates from 2018, um, her, her own aunt and cousin uh, were um, uh, murdered uh, and, and had gone missing. I actually want to be able to say their name, so hang on a second. So, um, you know, Lorelai was able to start in 2012, the Butterflies in Spirit, it's a dance group um, for family members of MMIWG, and it was with the idea of empowering Indigenous women and raising awareness about her aunt, Belinda Williams, um, who was missing since 1978, and her, and her cousin, um, who was murdered in 1996, uh, Tanya Holick. You know, I think about her and, and, and how we continue to work with her and support um, that work because it's so important you know it goes back to that we when you know someone's story you know what they're what, what they're going to be passionate about and how and and how they're going to show up for these different issues and for her her story very much centers her in in the passion of of doing the work for MMIWG you know and I and I sometimes think um she comes to us with such a strong as a, such a strong leader already, you know. But I I I hope and I and I think that um, part of the strength of of lifting up her and her work um, has been in that collective, in that you know the other women who are a part of her cohort, in the you know 
a hundred women who have come, hundreds of women who have come through the program over the 10 years, um, you know, knowing that you're part of something larger and, and that um, regardless of, of what you're advocating for, you have people to support that across the country. Um, so I think that's a very powerful story. Um, you know, our, we have we have local graduates uh, around Annie Ganesh. Um, I particularly um, have kept in contact with Carla Stevens, who is one of our graduates from Buckingham, um, and her work in sexual violence and in uh, against Indigenous women um, is very very important work. You know, she's gone on to to lead programs um, and her head programs like the Needed Program. Um, which is a project focused on inclusion, friendship, and passing on Indigenous knowledge. Um, I think, you know, Carla herself came to us um, with some really great skills already, uh, and very she's very community-minded and, and very responsive to things that are happening in her community, you know, so to help build those skills and then support her in her work going forward has been um, extremely uh, fulfilling and and, uh, you know, I think sometimes it's just upholding, upholding that, that work. Um, she's a graduate from 2015. Okay. I also think of Martina Saunders, who is a 2019 graduate of the Indigenous Women and Community Leadership Program. Um, and she is also an advocate for uh, Indigenous women. Um, one of her stories that she uh, told recently is, they were having um, some uh, issues in their community, and basically the grandmother, the mothers and grandmothers, got together and and went into the streets and and um, stood up for their rights and and wanted change. And I I think you know if we have any um, if we've helped in in empowering her to feel like she can uh, empower her community to solve their own problems. I think that's the work that's important for us to do, you know, reminding them that they do have assets and gifts and that their communities are full of abundance and full of, of, um, of the solutions to their, to their most challenging problems. Thank you. Hi, I want to add to what Carrie Lynn was saying too about our graduates. I know in, um, having worked here at Cody almost three years now, and the opportunity to um, connect with, meet, and learn with and from um, women graduates and, and all graduates from many different countries. Um, particularly my, my, my teaching and work focuses around peace and conflict resolution and women's leadership. And, and, I, and I know hearing from particularly some of our graduates from Cameroon, and, and I know at least one of them is, is here on this session today, and the work that um, they have been doing in um, advocating for peace in, in, a, in a conflict zone at the same time while, while meeting with and trying to work with government officials, connecting with people on the ground, in particular women and young girls, to help make their everyday lives um, more bearable, um, to give them hope. And their stories really resonate with me and they, they've created networks and, and doing all sorts of great hard things in very compl complicated settings and you know, stepping out and beyond in order to, to do this type of stuff. I'm also, you know, as Carrie Lynn was saying, you know, it's, it's really about the opportunity to meet women doing what they're doing and finding ways that we can support them wherever, wherever they are, whether it's here in Canada or around the world. And so many, you know, I would say every woman who I have met through this work have, have touched me in unique ways and I've learned so much from them. And, and, and knowing that the change they are making um, in, in their communities for women and girls and, and others um, and, and supporting men in their communities to also make change, I think, you know, is really inspiring. 
And, and they're doing it in so many different ways. There's not just one way to make change. They're, they're, they're advocating and being activists in different and diverse spaces um, through justice, through healthcare, through education, and all of these ways are important. Thank you, Robin. And I have a question here for, um... I'll direct to Sarika and Veronica from your uh, vantage point. Is the role of the UN effective on women empowerment and what areas should be improved? Sure, I'll start. Um, I think when we say the UN, it's very broad and it's a set of diverse agencies, UNFPA, UNICEF, UN you know, UNDP, a lot of these different um, UN agencies are often working and I think in silos of each other. And there's an opportunity to really leverage what these investments that each are doing. And uh, I think that it's really powerful to see when um, these organizations make investments in, in really developing educational opportunities for girls and leveraging what's happening in um, girls' leadership, young women's leadership in different countries. Uh, I have often been invited to uh, support those investments and I do call them investments and a lot of people call them funding. And I do think that we need to call these investments because there is a return on investment. Um, and I believe that uh, often, um, you know, when I'm in, in the midst of that, I, I definitely see the, the, that we're working with systems that are often fraught, of, you know, they can be fraught and they're not perfect, but actually working within those systems, we can challenge uh, the patriarchy inside of them, the kinds of issues that we're often willing to talk about, but then by working within those systems, we can actually challenge them. And I think that's the, uh, you know, the kind of opportunity I can see in working with those agencies. Thank you. Sarika? Thank you, Veronica. I think you gave a very good head start. And uh, let me tell you that, you know, apart, apart from working in silos, they also work with states. So they, they, they are working with the governments per se, and which is what makes them a little defensive. So you've got to kind of protect your data. You can't say that the situation of women has really gone down and uh, you can't acknowledge that there is an adverse sex ratio over, over a decade. So, so that's one of the things. The thing, other thing is, you know, if you understand an issue and if you really want to work on an issue, let's say, for example, UNFPA, which works a lot around sexual and reproductive health rights, there's a politics of sexual and reproductive health rights, and which is why a lot, a lot of us in the feminist movement don't really take that as the base of women's uh, work or feminism. You know, it's this whole thing about a, a woman's reproductive and sexual health belonging to everyone else but her. So if you look at the set of contraception that exists, for women, it's very invasive. For men, it's very different. For uh, the, the, the spacing of children, you know, apart from her, practically everyone else chips in to decide for her. So if you're not really looking at the politics of why we need to talk about sexual and reproductive health, then it doesn't make so much sense to actually go and say, yeah, you, you know, you can have six, six seven children, but you know, have it well, have it in a hospital. And then there is an entire discourse around institutional deliveries. So I think that's where I feel UN uh, kind of lacks. And, uh, uh, but yes, there is a lot of good work that has come in because of UN. And I feel that a lot in conflict zones. And, and you know, as somebody who comes from India and herself sees a lot of civil war even inside India, you know, I, I think they come in very handy when it comes to a lot of basic civil, political and economic, social, socioeconomic rights. So I think on that, they make a lot of sense. And I, I feel that, you know, bodies like these need to exist. It's just that we need to push a little bit more. Mm -hmm. 
And with that, a question uh, posed to open to the, the whole panel. Um, if you could give recommendations on everyday changes our male allies can be making to removing patriarchal system of oppression. What's your call to action? As I'll start. <clears throat> um, for me, you know, I think about the, the men in my family and how they support, um, how they support me, how they support um, my sisters, uh, my daughter, my granddaughter, really um, celebrating who they are as women, who we are as women. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of it is just getting out of the way. <laughs> um, I don't know a more diplomatic way to say it other than uh, sometimes men just need to get out of the way. Um, we know ourselves, women know ourselves, we're strong. We have our teachings from our ancestors. We have our teachings from our mothers. We have our formal education. We have our experiences that uh, inform our lives. And, and I think that a lot of times, um, we need to not question women. We need to not question their motives, not question um, their processes, but accept them, accept the processes, accept um, the way in which we move forward. And yeah, get out of the way. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'll go next. I think that uh, apart from some of them getting out of the way, some of them have to stop bullying women and becoming and not and, and just not uh, debilitating women who are around them. I find that as a young professional, I worked with men who were uh, who humiliated me, who debilitated my professionalism and who made it seem like I was incapable. And so I would say though that has to stop that really has to stop. And I've also worked with an amazing man who was actually the one who was probably the most feminist person I've ever met, who is a, a true um, model of inclusion, a true model of uh, support to women and um, being able to see the strength of women as colleagues, not just as women who may be working with for him, but with him. And I think that that's also what I say, you know, more power to those men who are inviting uh, collaboration with us women. And I think that that's something that's, uh, that we need to see more of. I would like to build on what Krista and Veronica said. And while the women, while the men are getting out of the way, they can start working on um, looking at and, and breaking down toxic masculinity. I think that's really important. Um, and, you know, what it is, what it is, how it manifests in their lives, how it, um, where it comes from. And, and as women, um, uh, you know, we can support each other in this, but I think we, toxic masculinity needs to go. You know, just just to add add to the three of the very esteemed speak, speakers who made a lot of sense, I, I I'll quote Gloria Steinem, and when she says uh, women need men as much as a fish needs a bicycle, so you know how difficult is it for men to actually start believing that they are not as important as they are made out to be in a patriarchal world, so. Uh, that that realization has to come and you know you have to start respecting women that's start treating us as equals and i realized that that's very difficult for men to believe that that you know they are as equal or as good and, and or that we are as good as as bad as them and the second thing i want to say is we do need the economic resources we do need the property so you know 
50% population and 10% of resources won't work. So, you know, start parting with that. So some part of it is actually very, very physical, tangible, and apart from the ideological bit. Carolyn? Um, I haven't, honestly, haven't really thought about this a lot. I was relying on Veronica <laughs> to, to really answer this question, but then I, I'm reflecting on what I do in my own household. You know, I have a very uh, supportive husband who supports my travel and my work and um, not just mm, not just uh, is there in terms of like parenting and, and holding the ho down the household as well, but, um, you know, questioning uh, my work and, and, and really making me think um, from different perspectives. So I really appreciate that um, as somebody who, who I'm married to um, and, and supported by uh, not just, you know, not just acting in ways that, that support my work, um, you know, through childcare and, and, but, but through mutual support and, and, and challenging, you know, and I'm raising a son and I have to be very mindful, uh, you know, to um, raise him in good ways and, you know, talk to him about the reality of what it's like to be uh, an Indigenous woman and some of the, you know, being honest about stories, you know, I am a survivor of uh, childhood sexual abuse. And, you know, when it's age appropriate to share that with him, um, to make sure that he, uh, you know, is closer to uh, the land and closer to his culture than I was growing up. Um, those are all things that I think are important ways to ground him and help him be a strong man and to understand the um, the uh, challenges that that indigenous women face you know i was recently reading an article um about a young indigenous man who is um i think he's working out of saskatchewan you know he talked about supporting um especially indigenous women entrepreneurs uh, because he was in a position to do that. And I thought, wow, that's really, um, you know, setting a good example for others uh, to not just, you know, look at economic um, prosperity for the community that he's from and the communities that he's partnered with, but also looking um, at supporting uh, women as well. So those are kind of some examples I've reflected on. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Oh, very helpful. Thank you, Carolyn. And um, on my end, I wanted to leave you with a poem to think about here. Um, it's short. Um, and it's from Rupi Kaur, uh, titled, Not Your Convenient Figurehead. And it goes, I'm not interested in a feminism that thinks simply placing women at the top of oppressive systems is progress. And I read that, uh, last week and I thought, yes, visual representation is very important. And it's, it's great to be able to see and, and know things are possible. You know, you can't become what you can conceive and imagine. But in, in many ways, um, I, it dawned on me uh, in, in the work that we're doing at the CEI with um, youth employment and emerging adulthood and identity formation that I didn't envision myself or describe myself as a leader, because I always associate that with the capital L CEO top of the pyramid. But I'm very much more passionate about creating those horizontal networks and connections and, and in many ways seeing some all the work that I do as it, it needs to get done, right, which is a, a lot of work that women do. It's not really acknowledged as leadership but we really are holding things together, <laughs> keeping it together. Um, so I see the work, especially as a young woman, youngish woman um, in carrying that work and continuing that fight to really be a lot to do with expanding that definition of leadership um, where every woman, every person is able to 
identify with being able to have agency, have a voice, uh, choose and make decisions and be confident in them, be confident in taking up spaces and demanding um, to take up spaces. And in having these conversations that are intergenerational to understand um, the struggles, the overcoming, the impact stories like we've heard today shared by you all, um, understanding that I'm not reinventing the wheel and um, also having that asset-based approach to build that momentum and keep the energy going because we have come a long way. We are making progress. It's not just, you know, my grandmother carrying this load and then, you know, unloading to my mother and then she to me. There have been some, some progress that has been made there. So how do we broaden that definition of leadership by pointing at all the different stories and different ways that the people that we identify with in our communities, the work that they're doing, um, the boundaries they're pushing, um, and the impact they're having, uh, and, and the for the benefits that re we're reaping in our realities today. I wanted to thank you all for, for joining us today um, from far and wide, wherever you are across the world. Good morning, good evening, good night. <laughs> um, thank you to our wonderful panel here um, of brilliant disturbers. Um, Thank you all for joining us. I wanted to give a shout out specifically to Eileen Alma for being behind the scenes and putting all this together to our communication team, um, to the Cody International Institute at St. FX, uh, Center for Employment Innovation, where I work. Uh, thank you all for joining us.